Pre-internet, the image of these mass shooters was often categorized as the lonely bully kid, the awkward geeky loser who was pushed past their breaking point Sorry, nothing. and took it out on the whole school. While some of this imagery still prevails in the mainstream, what was in the mind of the shooter? The awkward walk, reduced eye contact. Deep down in some of the darkest corners of the internet, there are communities who have rebranded these individuals to some misunderstood, edgy, lone wolf. From thirsty edits one would think fans exclusively created for their favorite celebrity hunk, to artwork that seems to romanticize these individuals. While the general population is quick to attribute mental illness to these communities, there's actually a dark truth about how the internet has facilitated the rebranding of these individuals from loser to the suave Sigma male. Hey guys, it's Donna. I'm sure you can already tell by the title of the video that we will be covering a number of sensitive issues due to the distressing nature of this subject. Please proceed with caution or wait till the next video. I won't be offended. Now, if you are choosing to watch further, it's definitely going to be demonetized. So please do me a favor by hitting that like button just so this one won't get suppressed. To understand how this rebranding happened, we must first dive into these communities. Now, you can find them lots of places, but the current most popular spaces are Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok. Okay, so like I said, in these internet communities, these guys aren't portrayed as some geeky, awkward loser loner. They're portrayed as this mysterious Sigma male. What's a Sigma male, you ask? So according to Urban Dictionary, the most trusted source ever, it is defined as a more internally focused sibling to the alpha male. While the alpha male quantifies himself on his high position in the social hierarchy, a sigma male prefers to forego the social hierarchy and need for external validation altogether and pursue internal strength instead. Essentially, a loner or a stray man, although sigma males may have a close circle of friends and loved ones with whom they share a deep connection. The sigma male is not socially inept, but simply socially disinterested. This definition is really long, so if you want to read the rest, just pause. I do like the example they have here. John. Hey, who's that over there on the table by himself? Mary. Oh, that's Patrick. He's a bit of a sigma male. If you do look this up, some of the most common examples you will see are Patrick Bateman from American Psycho and Tyler Durden from Fight Club. Now, this whole branding has been applied to mass killers. Let's actually regretfully look into these communities, shall we? All right, so here's Tumblr uh, with plenty of artwork of mass killers. Uh, I'd say they're drawn pretty cool. And if I were them, I guess I would say that you couldn't argue that it's bad because technically the artist isn't like promoting them or saying like what they did was good or whether they're not validating that what they did was good. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it, it's too much. A lot of the artwork is very cringe. Like this one. Someone made the Columbine killers as anime girls. There's even like uwu images of the Idaho killer. Why? What is the point? Why? Then you got the gruesome stuff like the photos of the killer's corpse with some cheesy quote like it's one of those Instagram pages that only post quotes. Love is more valuable than anything I know. How does that image and that quote go together? Oh, yeah. So edits aren't just for Timothy Chalamet, or for these guys too. This, this literally says they're so silly. Yup, just a couple of silly boys. I just don't like this one. There's also fanfic here. This one is about Adam Lanza. Yes, that same Adam Lanza. You guys would be watching TV. Put his hand on your thigh and you'd ask him what he's doing because usually he doesn't like physical contact. I want to make you feel good. I, I can't read this anymore, I'm sorry. So how in the world did this rebranding happen? 
A lot of actors struggle with being pigeonholed, but these guys who did horrible things have somehow rebranded as, you know. Well, to figure this out, we've got to look back to 1999. In late April 1999, two boys at Columbine High School claimed the lives of 13 people before taking their own. Contrary to popular opinion, this was not an act of bullied kids lashing out. In Dave Cullen's Columbine, it's actually revealed that both boys were fairly well-liked and very active in school affairs. One even had a prom date. Another thing this book discusses is that Columbine was not intended to be just a shooting. The boys planted bombs in the cafeteria with the purpose of ending as many lives as they could. However, the poor construction of the bombs kept the Columbine death toll from topping 600 and prevented the shooters from achieving the legacy they wanted. And that is to surpass the infamy of the Oklahoma City bomber, whose actions claimed the lives of 168 people. And to be remembered as fearsome terrorists. But this doesn't mean that there was no legacy left behind. Y2K came and went, with computers still well and working. As the internet grew and expanded, so too did the unique subcultures therein. There is a forum for everything, from vacuum part enthusiasts, to armchair exotic animal vets, to every kind of fandom. Unfortunately, this wonderful diversity of content does have a dark side. A series of videos called The Basement Tapes Left Behind by the Shooters made their rounds on the internet. These videos documented their shooting preparation process. It showed them firing guns, making pipe bombs, and generally acting macho while mouthing off. The performance put on by both boys seems to actively counter the anxious school shooter stereotype. They instead portray themselves as dark, brooding, masculine individuals. They're dressed like the main character of a movie. Sociologist Natalie Payton states that the shooters were rejecting any image of themselves as weak or sissies, corresponding to a previously well-established image of school shooters. By subverting the image of mass shooters as weak or cowardly, and instead making them something of a figure of masculinity, the shooters seem to have made mass shootings into an outlet for emotional release for other insecure men. Peyton goes on to say, The role of their videos is pivotal. It shows their intrinsic individuality while portraying a violent identity based on a hyper-normative stereotype of masculinity. In their minds, they become anti-heroic icons of modern times, thus redefining their identity and reversing the roles of domination. And when you go back and peer inside many of these communities that romanticize school shooters, you will find a lot of the artwork, the memes, the videos, to mirror the image illustrated in the basement tapes. In fact, the Columbine shooters seem to be the most popular in these communities. However cringy and uncomfortable as these things make us feel, there may also be real-life consequences to this rebranding. Now, thousands were drawn to these videos when they were leaked online. Many who watched were harmless, passive viewers. But some of them were people like the man who would kill 32 people in the Virginia Tech massacre of 2007. This man had spent quite some time digging into the Columbine shooting. He seemed to idolize both shooters. Mentioning them in adulating terms, in the video manifesto he sent to news stations shortly before the massacre. He said he was inspired to follow in their footsteps, mentioning his desire to repeat Columbine, even in his own high school assignments. He referred to mass shooters as a generation of martyrs, like the Columbine boys, and strove to join their ranks. He of course did so, and many followed in his footsteps, with many similarly praising him and the Columbine shooters. And this list of inspired shooters is extensive. It's gonna be a big event. And when you see me on the news, you'll all know who I am. In a study titled Expressive Violence, Natalie Payton and Julian Fidget go on to say, 
the Columbine shooters had carefully documented the preparation of their murderous project through written letters, diaries, blogs, and audiovisual material. A portion of those who carried out a shooting thereafter followed in their footsteps. They went to creative lengths to produce their own multimedia packages, containing various contents such as video recordings and self-portraits, to stage their identity and explain their reasoning behind their actions. Notwithstanding the fact, news outlets never fail to broadcast these self-produced contents within the midst of the global disruptive media event that follows shooters' violent actions. It quickly became obvious that the role of mediatization provided through participatory media. Many are bewildered at how a mass killer's vlog is able to radicalize some who consume it. Perhaps this will be easier to understand if we examine other communities on the internet that were not traditionally considered cool, and somehow the internet rebranded them as well. Gaming, entrepreneurship, and finance. Here, gamers aren't nerds who live in their mom's basement. They're rich influencers who go to house parties. Entrepreneurs aren't disheveled, unsuccessful businessmen. They're hardworking hustlers attempting to escape the traditional 9 to 5 by following their dreams. Finance majors aren't boring nerds who are really good at Excel. They're rich bros with a fancy car. From vlogs, blogs, and Instagram posts, these communities have effectively rebranded as cool due to the internet as well. And while they are far from controversial, this rebranding has happened in a similar way to the mass killers. Interestingly, how this happens is a process that almost everyone can relate to. Generally, people tend to latch onto things that make them feel confident and strong. Think of movie characters, book characters, you admire these characters because there is something about them you relate to. You're often introduced to a flaw or a conflict you identify with, and then taken on a journey where they overcome it. Their story makes you feel as if you can overcome this same flaw too. We also gravitate towards influencers we relate to and root for them to overcome their endeavors. How much we relate may even exceed that of a movie character because the creators we follow are regular people just like us. Hey, I'm a gamer too, so this guy might be cool and I'm gonna watch him. Now, naturally, creators tend to publish the best parts of their lives to illustrate themselves. That's just how social media works. No one is going to post themselves being toxic, being a loser, or failing. We're all the main characters in our own stories. and. In that sense, these uncool niches have been rebranded as sexier by the uploader. That's right, not all gamers are basement nerds. That rebrand is further bolstered when these niches attain popularity and the uploader is rewarded monetarily and with status. Hey, I'm not a gamer, but if that guy can go to wild parties and get rich, maybe gaming isn't so bad. Seeing someone succeed in something that everyone in our real life has belittled can be empowering. The audiovisual material from the Columbine shooters likely have the same effect on would-be mass murderers. This is where empowerment can go very wrong, and the internet facilitates many of these spaces that help do so. In the book Mass Killers, Former FBI Director James Comey is quoted, Because the internet offers the ability for people to consume poison and radicalize entirely in private, either through a device they are holding in their hand or inside their house, our visibility is necessarily limited. And so we constantly worry about who is out there on this journey from consuming poison to acting on it. Self-radicalization from these mediums, as well as groups dedicated to idolizing these shooters, seem to be playing a role more and more in mass shootings. When the Columbine shooters created the basement tapes, they designed their appearance and behavior carefully, depicting themselves as the embodiment of high masculinity and power. Their message of violence as a means for media attention slash inquiry resonated with some of those learning about Columbine years later. The aestheticization of mass shootings as a kind of edgy, misunderstood outlier, and therefore perhaps the creation of a more sympathetic slash compelling image, 
as well as the promise of action resulting in power, seems to have tantalized many into self-radicalization. How radicalization results from this is another interesting question, and perhaps best answered by looking at the Freudian defense mechanism known as compensation. Compensation is considered a mature defense mechanism which motivates people to try to make up for perceived or real inferiorities by building up other areas. One of the more common examples of compensation is the big truck as a compensation for a little dick. But when someone is consistently angry or always finding new reasons to be angry, it means they have a very, 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 very small dick. Obviously, <laughs> Obviously this isn't a fact. Not every big truck driver has a little dick. At least there aren't any studies on it. <laughs> Keep it together. <laughs> Nonetheless, the manifestos, the videos, and the comments in various forums from a lot of these shooters suggests a common characteristic. Many of these perpetrators exhibit a sort of desperation to be something more. Adam Lanza, the shooter who took the lives of 27 elementary school children and teachers at Sandy Hook, is a good example. The 27-year-old can be best described as a misanthropic loner. Having internalized the image of himself as a loser, Lanza spent a lot of time at home on his computer. He researched mass shooters incessantly, to the extent that he builds a spreadsheet that examined 500 mass shooters and, when printed out, was 7 by 14 feet in width and length. In addition to this, he was also a frequent poster to Columbine discussion forums, where he would share his views, gripes, and dreams. The posts he made on these sites are perhaps the best glance into his motivations left in the wake of his suicide. It was in these online spaces that he revealed his hatred for society and how he wished for its collapse describing living among apes as his wet dream, and often spoke about his hatred for culture. He is repeatedly noted as having a fixation on the subject of killing children, with some evidence of pro-pedophilia material being found on his computer as well. Lanza wanted to go into the military but was discouraged by his mother, who he would also kill in his rampage. Of these military aspirations, the author of The Enigma of Adam Lanza's Mind and Motivations for Murder, Dr. Peter Langman, points out at least one reason why Lanza felt he had to compensate. As discussed elsewhere, many shooters not only had military aspirations, but were also poor physical specimens. Their desire to be soldiers may have been an attempt to establish a sense of masculinity. This may have been the case with Lanza. He was 6 feet tall, but only weighed 112 pounds. This is extraordinarily thin, perhaps emaciated. In addition to this, Randy Stair and Alvaro Castillo, other shooters inspired by Columbine, were both quoted as expressing what could be interpreted as romantic slash sexual feelings towards other men, with Castillo claiming he would have had gone to prom with the mastermind behind Columbine and Stare, who often expressed gender dysphoria, declaring his love for the mastermind, with the added no homo disclaimer. The overtures for the Columbine shooters may suggest a repressed attraction toward men, something that individuals like Stare and Castillo would not be able to tolerate due to prejudiced beliefs about masculinity and homosexuality, and therefore something they may have felt the need to compensate for. In order to reassert their masculinity, Stare and Castillo may have been drawn to this course of action that has been aestheticized for maximum masculinity, and an action that everyone was afraid of happening. Now, I know what you're thinking. Just because a few of these guys were really into true crime blogs doesn't mean the whole space was the cause of their radicalization. However, when looking at America's deadliest shootings, there is an observable change in their pattern with the onset of the internet. From 1949 to 2022, there were at least 30 mass shootings that resulted in the deaths of 10 or more people. 10 of those occurred 50 years before the 2000s. Meanwhile, 13 of those happened in the 2010s alone. By 2022, 
three of the 30 most fatal shootings in American history have already occurred in the 2020s. Shootings with high fatalities appear to be increasing during the onset of the millennia. Perhaps it's a coincidence, but during this period, the masses were starting to adopt the internet into their homes more and more. Before 2000, most mass shootings occurred within residential areas, be it the home of the killer, the house of someone they knew, or their own neighborhood. Other than that, the majority of these shootings occurred at restaurants and other recreational destinations. After the year 2000, though, a troubling trend appeared. An increase of reported shootings were happening in schools, stores, recreational areas, all of these previously classified as relatively safe pre-internet. There seems to be a clear trend of these atrocities happening in public areas. Recent years have also shown a steep increase in killers looking for fame or motivated by hate. So what exactly am I advocating for? The shutdown of these spaces? While an idealistic plan is specially for the normie, it's probably not very realistic. When these spaces are shut down or limited, they immediately prop up somewhere else. Take the true crime community on Tumblr, for instance. A once thriving hellscape for cringy mass shooter glorification art has been reduced to longtime users calling the community dead due to Tumblr cracking down on this type of content. However, you can easily find a more lively community on Twitter and TikTok. As you know, the solution for this issue is complex, with different political groups continuously arguing how it can be mitigated. Common sense gun control, arming teachers, placing emphasis on mental health education, or even limiting violent video games. The debate has been going on for years and years. And listen, if you can solve it, I think America will appreciate it. Now, this data does not prove causation. Everybody knows that. Not all the people who participate in this community goes on to be a mass killer. It does, though, as we have seen, attract those who are already thinking those violent thoughts. The content in these spaces validate and empower further violent action. And what I think we are doing correctly is actually going into these places where one may be radicalized and searching for potential threats. It's definitely not a perfect solution, but I think it's a great start. In mid-October 2022, a man in Ohio was caught planning a hate-fueled shooting on women. The man is a self-identified incel, or for those out of the loop, an involuntary celibate, who was planning a gender-based hate crime against women allegedly hoping to kill as many possible in his rampage. His vocality on incel movement websites, thankfully, did not go unnoticed. He was arrested while planning the spree, and no one was harmed. Now, I think a good way to conclude this video is to hear why someone would join these communities. Perhaps if we could understand them a little bit better, this becomes another tool to stop future tragedies. A user posted on Reddit and titled it TCC Twitter. TCC Twitter. If you've experienced it, I'm sure you know just how bizarre and jarring it is. Do you think it's being edgy, pushed to its most extreme, or do you think these people are completely mentally ill? A former community member replied, I actually used to use TCC TWT and consider myself part of the TCC. I think it's definitely both. In my case, it was. At the time, I was struggling with very bad depression, suicidal thoughts, and self-harm. When I found Columbine, I looked to the shooters, especially Dylan, and related to them. Not only would I try to be edgy and emulate their clothing styles or mannerisms, but I also felt the connection to Dylan. It was a mix of things. However, because I also have ADHD and a huge hyperfixation on Columbine, which is hard to let go, but after getting therapy and finding new and better interests, I can happily say I'm completely out of all that. TCC TWT is a terrible place full of some people who are just going through a rough time and coping badly, but some people who are genuinely sick. I've known of people in that community who seriously wanted to hurt people. But I unfortunately just chose bad coping skills. Anyway, I hope that helps anyone understand why someone might stoop to the level of fangirling over a murderer. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. That's the end of the video. I'll see you guys next time. Stay psyched.
Okay, so in these internet communities, okay, so in these internet communities, like I said, these guys aren't portrayed. Okay, so in these internet, shut the up.